Savior Jesus to worship here at Living Shepherd. It's a joy to gather together with you this morning. We have some wonderful blessings that we get to celebrate this morning. We get to see our Sunday school kids who have been working hard on a song that they will be singing for worship. We get to see some new people join uh, the fellowship of our church family this morning. And most of all, we get the wonderful privilege of seeing that Christ is our King. He is the one who is righteous. And so we'll talk this morning about what that means for us. How do we approach this righteous king? May God bless your worship this morning as we talk about that. You'll see a, an unfamiliar face up here this morning. This is Pastor Mark Parsons. He serves our church body with Truth in Love Ministries. So he'll be sharing God's word with you this morning. He'll also be doing a special presentation after worship, which you're all invited for about sharing your faith, sharing the good news of this righteous king with others. Our worship begins this morning with our opening hymn, I Heard the Voice of Jesus Say It's Printed for You in the Worship Folder on page 3. Let's sing together. Thank you. 
Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy, Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us, and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. In the peace of this forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. By your victory you have broken the power of the evil one. Fill our hearts with joy and peace as we look with hope to that day when every creature in heaven and earth will acclaim you, King of kings and Lord of lords, to your unending praise and glory. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. Good morning. You may have heard that the United Kingdom has a new king. King Charles III had been waiting to be king of the United Kingdom for a long, long time. And now that he's king, there are people all over the world that want to go and visit this man who is the new king of England. How would you go? If you were to approach a royal figure like King Charles, what would you need to do? Well, you probably need an invitation for one. You're not just going to be able to walk into Buckingham Palace and walk right up to the king. You need to be invited. And when you enter into the presence of royalty like a king of England, there are certain protocols that you must follow in order to approach the king. Certain words that you're supposed to speak as you approach them. Certain gifts that one must bring in order to come into the presence of a king. Today we're going to really wrestle with that question. What does it take to approach not just a king like Charles, but a perfect and a righteous king, a holy king named God? Throughout history, God has really been helping his people answer that question. He's shown us that he is holy and he is merciful. He is perfect and he is just. And we start to really think about those characteristics of God and we ask this question, if God is perfect and holy, and he is just, and I am sinful and not holy, how do I approach a perfect and holy God? In the Old Testament, God wanted his people Israel to really understand that. He wanted them to realize that all the kings that they had, the kings of Israel and the kings of Judah, they paled in comparison to a future king who would be perfect and holy and righteous, unlike the kings of their day. Our first lesson for today from Jeremiah chapter 23 takes place at a time in the history of God's people where their kings were awful. 
They were doing all the things that the worst kings of Israel and Judah had ever done and more. But Jeremiah had this simple message. God is going to provide a better king. A king who will shepherd his people Israel in a way that no prior king, not even David, perhaps many would consider the best king ever of Israel, had ever done. Listen to the way that Jeremiah describes this future righteous king. He says, therefore, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says to the shepherds who tend my people. Because you have scattered my flock and have driven them away and have not bestowed care on them, I will bestow punishment on you for the evil you have done, declares the Lord. I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them, and I will bring them back to their pasture, where they will be fruitful and increase in number. I will place shepherds over them who will tend them, and they will no longer be afraid or terrified. None, nor will any be missing, declares the Lord. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up to David a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved, and Israel will live in safety. This is the name by which he will be called, the Lord our Righteousness. We'll join together now in singing a song about that king, the king of love my shepherd is. The congregation is invited to join in the second and following refrain.
Please stand for the words and works of Jesus in the gospel. The gospel is recorded in Luke 23, beginning with verse 35. How does this king look now? The king that Jeremiah had prophesied was a righteous and holy king, one who would shepherd his people. But now this king was hanging on a tree. He looked quite powerless indeed. And yet there was one, one man who hung there, a criminal next to him, that realized that this man indeed was the Son of God and was filled with power. And what did it take for this sinful criminal to approach this perfect and righteous king? Listen to what happens. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others, let him save himself if he is the Christ of God, the Chosen One. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. And then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth. Today you will be with me in paradise. This is the gospel of our Lord. Please be seated as we join in the hymn of the day before the throne of God above. <coughs> Thank <laughs>
the portion of God's Word for our consideration today from Romans chapter 3 is probably a Lutheran pastor's at least top 10 favorite Bible verses to preach on. I don't know how many times pastor has already had the opportunity to preach on Romans 3, but it's a text that often come up, comes up on Reformation Sunday. And it's a Reformation text because Martin Luther said that in these words is the whole of the gospel. Or the gospel is found in these words perhaps better than any place in the Bible. Romans chapter 3 was Paul's great treatise on what it takes for a sinful man to stand in the presence of a holy God, not in fear or trepidation, but in joy on that great day when Christ returns. Listen to Paul's words from Romans chapter 3, beginning with verse 19. He says, now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. But now a righteousness from God apart from the law has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. He did this to demonstrate that his justice, because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his justice at the present time, so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Where, then, is boasting? It is excluded. On what principle? On that of observing the law? No, but on that of faith. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from observing the law. This is the word of our Lord. We pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O God, our rock, our refuge, and our redeemer. Amen. Martin Luther found great comfort in these words because he had been wrestling with a problem, a problem that was very common in his day. The problem was a question. What does it take for sinful man to be made right in the presence of a holy God? And the church of his day had completely distorted the answer to that question to such an extent that Luther couldn't sleep at night. He would toss and turn, wondering how, ever, how it would ever be that he could have peace and comfort before a perfect and holy God. Well, today, as we find out Luther's answer to that question, we're going to learn a little bit from two old Latin phrases. We're going to learn a little bit from two songwriters. One of them is a Lutheran songwriter named Paul Speritus, and the other is a more modern songwriter named Taylor Swift. And finally, we're going to learn a little bit about the answer to this question from Santa Claus. Yes, you heard it. Taylor Swift and Santa Claus, all in the same sermon. In Luther's day, the way that the church at that time was answering that question, how is sinful man made right with a holy God, was really through the answer that people had been giving for hundreds of years. It comes from the law. The first Latin phrase I want you to think about today is one that Martin Luther really coined. It's called the opinio legis. For those of you that didn't translate that on the spot, it simply means the opinion of the law. Back in Luther's day, as well as today, a lot of people think that the way that a sinner is made right with a holy God is through by works of the law. And so as we hear the Ten Commandments or the other commandments of God, we say that the way that a sinful man can enter into the presence of a holy God is through obedience, by keeping rules and regulations, and eventually you can approach a holy God. But Luther had a problem with that. As he read the law of God, 
with all its do's and all of its don'ts, he realized something. I haven't done all of the do's, and I have done all of the don'ts. And the church of his day really told him, well, well Martin Luther, you know, the, the problem is, is you're not reading this right. God, he doesn't really want you to keep all of the laws absolutely perfectly. And if you have, have failed in any way, there are ways that you can make up for them. During that time, they really taught that God's grace was this infusing power that kind of comes to the sinful man as like an adrenaline shot. When you get baptized, you get your first shot of grace, and you start to work towards God. When you have your first communion, you get a little bit more grace. When you get confirmed, you get a little bit more grace. Every time you receive the Lord's Supper, you get a little bit more grace. And they said, yeah, maybe sinful man starts way over here from <coughs> God. But as long as he gets on that path, and as one of my professors in college says, as long as he stops at the gas pump of the sacramental grace system along the way, as long as he gets to heaven with a full tank of grace, then he'll be able to stand before a perfect and holy God without fear. The question that weighed on Martin Luther was, how do you know when you've done enough? How do you know when you have enough grace? And that's when the church of his day, some of the scholastic teachers, started to say this Latin phrase. Try and translate this one on the fly again. The Latin was facera quod in se est, which literally translated as do what is in you or do the best that is in you. They were saying at his day that as long as you follow your conscience, as long as you listen to that little voice inside you that says do this or don't do that, as long as you listen to that and follow it, that's all that God expects. They even started to teach that as long as you followed your conscience, even outside of the church, even outside of Jesus, one could be saved. But for Martin Luther, that was the problem. His conscience convicted him daily. At night, it made him toss and turn continually. He said, my conscience is telling me that I'm a sinner. My conscience is telling me that there is this righteous God that I will never be able to approach. Later on, when Martin Luther wrote about the righteousness of God, he said, as I thought about that phrase, righteousness of God, I hated it. I hated that perfect and holy God who was wrathful and angry that I would never be able to come anywhere close to appeasing. But then something happened. He started to read God's word, and he realized that this God that he thought was only wrathful, that was only righteous in this perfect and holy sense that he could never be, was actually a God who had made him righteous through faith. As he started to read the scriptures for himself, rather than just listening to them as the church of his day was teaching, he realized that this great king that they had been teaching about was his king, his lord, and his savior. And he was a God who had done everything to come and bring them back to himself as a shepherd. He read these words. He says, it says, Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. During his day, it was being taught, really, that the law enabled one to become obedient to God and therefore able to enter into his presence. What Martin Luther discovered was that, no, the law doesn't make you obedient. The law shows you that you're disobedient. It makes it so that every mouth has to be silenced before God who says, should I let you into my kingdom based on what you've done? And no hand should raise and say, yes, pick me. Every mouth should stand there silent. Martin Luther <coughs> discovered, rediscovered, it's not that this was the first time that anyone had ever known this, that when you stand before God's law, the law is a mirror. One of the, the famous things that he really taught was the first use of the law. That when you look into the mirror of God's law, it doesn't show you how to become obedient. It shows you that you're sinful and dirty. A, a Lutheran pastor friend of mine said that when you look in a mirror at your house, is the mirror the thing that cleans you up? 
No, he says, the mirror is the thing that shows you that you need a bath, and it sends you to the wash basin or to the bathtub. He said, the law is the thing that shows you're a sinner and sends you to your baptism. Sinful man, though, does not want to stare into the mirror of God's law and acknowledge the fact that he is a sinful human being. We want to elevate ourselves and say, I don't have a problem. I'm pretty good, or at least I'm better than other people. That was really the way in Luther's day that a lot of people were looking at the law. Well, God, his requirements, it's not about actually keeping all of it. As long as I'm just better than other people, then I'll be okay. Or, or maybe eventually I can work off some of my sins in what they called purgatory. And so they were giving the people a false hope rather than sending them to the mirror of the law. I told you that we were going to learn something from Taylor Swift today. Taylor Swift is not where I usually go to get my theological insights. But Taylor Swift, just a few weeks ago, released, I believe it's her 10th full-length album. That's, that's crazy to think. She's, she's not that old. She's got 10 albums. Top, she had the top 10 songs, all 10 of them, for a few weeks on the pop charts. All top 10 songs were her songs from this album. That's crazy. One of those songs from her album, Midnight's, which is all about her philosophical ponderings after midnight as she's trying to wrestle with life and how to make sense of the fame and the destruction and, and all of the relationships she's had. She wrote a song called Anti-Hero, in which the refrain goes like this. She says, it's me. Hi, I'm the problem. It's me. At tea time, everybody agrees I'll stare directly at the sun, but never in the mirror. I love that phrase. Hi. It's me. I'm the problem. It's me. I don't know if Taylor Swift is a Christian. But in that phrase, she's acknowledging something. The problem isn't outside of us. The problem isn't that the world makes us sinful. The problem is me. When we stare into the mirror of God's law, the, the mirror that Taylor Swift says she doesn't want to stare in, we should stand there and say, hi, it's me. I'm the problem, it's me. You see, God in his word is telling us that trying is not hard enough. It's not about keeping the law in its entirety that the, the teachers of Luther's day started to say. What God really wants is just do what's in you, try, strive. And, and we hear that, and that sounds good. And unfortunately, the people that I work with in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, Mormons, that's what they're taught. They're taught that all God's really looking for is you to strive and try to do your best. But there's a problem with that. How do you ever know if you've done enough? How do you know if your trying will ever get you to God's presence? You see, that trying gospel, that's not the Christian gospel. That's the Santa Claus gospel, isn't it? A few months ago, a Christian pastor friend of mine gave me a new children's book. It's called When Santa Learned the Gospel. And it's really funny. So an elf happens to go to a Christmas service one year, and he hears the Christmas gospel, and he goes back and tells Santa Claus, like, yeah, we're not doing this right. And it's really hilarious how Santa then becomes a Christian and starts to teach the Christian gospel. On the back of the book is my favorite part, though, because the author describes why he wrote this book. Um, he explains that he was at a community Christmas concert event, and after all of the carols had been sung, Santa Claus came out, and as he always does, he says, who's been a good little boy or girl? And the whole crowd, all of the kids said, me! And then he asked the second question, well, who's been a naughty little boy or girl? And again, every kid in the crowd yelled, me! And he awkwardly stopped and said, well, you've at least been trying? And he realized something, this pastor. Trying is what the Christmas gospel is about. As long as you've tried to be a good little boy or girl, that God will dispense his good gifts to you. And he explained, and he had been writing this book um, at Halloween, he explained that, that the gospel of Halloween is actually closer to the truth than the gospel of Christmas. And that made me like, what? What do you mean? And he said this. He said that the gospel of Christmas is that God gives gifts 
to the goat, those that have at least tried to be good. Where at Halloween, when you go out on the streets, you see the good, the bad, and the ugly all knocking on doors, and alike, each of them receives candy and treats. Not if they're good, not if they're bad, but everybody gets it. He says, that's really the Christian gospel, isn't it? The problem that Martin Luther discovered in all of this was that it's not about trying. Verse 20, he says, Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by observing the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. So many people from the beginning of time have looked at the law and said, the law is the thing that's going to save me. But instead, Luther read on, and he realized the law was to point him to the one thing that could save him. Anytime there's a Bible verse, like verse 21 here, that starts with a big B-U-T, take notice. Something came before this that is going to be fixed by what comes after it. But he says, but now a righteousness from God apart from the law has been made known to which the law and prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace that came through redemption that came by Christ Jesus. And this was the part that really started to affect Luther. He said, God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. He did this to demonstrate his justice because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. Many, including those Mormons that I witness to on a regular basis, when they look at Jesus and the reason that he came, they hold him up as a great moral teacher and an example to follow. They say, all we, God is really looking is for us to follow the example of Jesus, and one day we can become like him. That's not what Paul says here. Paul said that Jesus didn't come to be our example. He came to be our substitute. The way in which he describes this is in verse 25 where he says, God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement. I didn't tell you you were going to learn a Greek word today, but the Greek word here is the word hilasterio. It is this word that means propitiation or atonement, and it harkens back to the Old Testament and the great day of atonement. The hilasterion in the Old Testament was the mercy seat, that part of the Ark of the Covenant with those cherubim on it. And do you remember what happened with that Ark of the Covenant? Every year on what was called the great day of atonement, God showed the people how he was going to deal with their sin. The priest would sacrifice a goat and a bull, a cow. He would collect the blood in a basin. He would sprinkle some of it on the people, and then he would do something crazy. He would walk through the tabernacle carrying this basin filled with blood, walk into what was called the Holy of Holies, that most sacred place in the tabernacle or the temple where only one priest got to go one day each year, and he would walk in there and approach this beautiful golden Ark of the Covenant that contained manna in a, a, in a jar, contained the budded staff of Aaron, and most importantly, do you remember what else was in the Ark of the Covenant? The law, the Ten Commandments, the you shall and the you shall not. And the way that Leviticus has described it is that when God sits on his mercy, he sees the you shall and you shall not. But one day each year, the priest would come in there, and he would take blood out of that basin, and he would sprinkle it all over the top of this beautiful mercy seat. What was he doing? He was covering up the law with the blood of a sacrifice. And the blood of that yearly sacrifice pointed forward to the blood of the perfect sacrifice that Jesus would make on the cross when he cried out, It is finished, to Tetelestai, paid in full. He was the fulfillment of that great day of atonement. And all of the do's were done, all of the don'ts were undone, and Jesus says to you and to me, The law that you have not kept, I kept in your place. And now he invites us his sheep, to join him, the great shepherd, before the throne of God. And we stand there now, not raising our hands, saying, look, it's me, it's me, I'm so great. We say, no, it's Jesus, 
It's Jesus. It's only Jesus. We, through faith, have that same humble attitude of that penitent criminal on the cross who simply turned to Jesus and said, Remember me. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus didn't turn to him and say, Sorry, buddy. You had your chance at keeping the law. You had your chance at getting baptized. You had your chance at getting infused with my grace and working towards me. No, he said, today, through faith today, you will be with me in paradise. My dear friends, when you look into the mirror of God's law, don't assume that it is showing you to the way to clean yourself up and become perfect. Instead, let it send you to the cross of Jesus and there find comfort for your soul. I told you that we would hear from two songwriters today. I'd ask you now to take out the hymnals in front of you and turn to page 390. This is a Lutheran hymn, Salvation Unto Us Has Come, by the hymn writer Paul Speritus. He wrote this shortly after Luther rediscovered the gospel in Romans chapter 3. And it's one of the clearest hymns in our hymnal that describes law and gospel in the way that they're connected. Let's close our study of God's word today by reading verses 1 through 3 and verse 5. We'll read together, salvation unto us is come. Together? Salvation unto us is come, by God's free grace and favor. Good works could not avert our doom. They help and save us never. Faith looks to Jesus Christ alone, who did for all the world atone. He is the one Redeemer. What God does in his law demand, and none to him can render, brings wrath and woe on every hand, for man the vile offender. Our flesh has not those pure desires, the spirit of the law requires, and lost is our condition. It is a false misleading dream that God his law has given, that sinners then can themselves redeem and by their works gain heaven. The law is but a mirror bright to bring the inbred sin to light that lurks within our nation. Verse 5. Since Christ has full atonement made and brought to us salvation, every Christian therefore may be glad and build on this foundation. Your grace alone, dear Lord, I plead, your death is now my life indeed, for you have paid my ransom. How does a sinful, imperfect human being approach a righteous and holy king? Your grace alone, dear Lord, I plead. Your death is now my life indeed, for you have paid my ransom. May God grant that you have that confidence this day and always, that you are Jesus and Jesus is yours. Amen. Please stand. We'll join now in confessing our faith in our risen Savior King using the words of the Nicene Creed. Together, page 8. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church, 
We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. At this time, we'll gather our thank offering. We won't be passing an offering plate, but there is one sitting in the small table in the back. If you're so moved, you may drop your offering in that plate at any time. If you're a guest or a visitor with us this morning, it's important that you know you're not obligated to give an offering. We're simply happy to have you here and to share this good news of our righteous King with you. Your gifts and your offerings certainly are welcomed and appreciated, though, because this is one of the ways that our congregation works together to take this good news of Jesus out into our community. Also, during this time of the offering, we kindly ask that everyone, whether you're a member of Living Shepherd or you're just a guest or visitor with us this morning, we'd love it if everyone would please sign the friendship registers that are located in the racks beneath the chairs at the center of each row. this time, I'd invite Gil and Courtney Lowry, as well as Pastor Paul and Betty Lang, to come forward. Dear friends in Christ, after a review and instruction in the simple teachings of the Bible and our Lutheran Church, you have requested to be united with us in fellowship and love. You have come before this congregation today to confess your unity of faith with us and to take your place as part of this community of believers. Therefore, lift up your hearts and joyfully answer these questions. Do you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? If so, answer, I do. I do. Do you believe that the teachings of the Evangelical Lutheran Church, as you have come to know them, are faithful to the word of God? If so, answer, I do. Do you desire to remain faithful to the teachings of Christ, to be diligent in the use of God's word and sacraments, and to lead a godly life as the Lord gives you strength? If so, answer, I do, and I ask God to help me. I do, and I ask God to help me. Is it your desire to join us in worship and mission, and to support this work with your prayers and gifts? If so, answer, it is, and I ask God to help me. It is, and I ask God to help me. With sincere joy, then, we welcome you in fellowship and love. Brothers and sisters in Christ, as we welcome Gil and Courtney and Reverend Paul and Betty Lang to our Christian family, I encourage you in the name of Jesus to keep them in your minds, to hold them in your hearts, and to pray for them again and again. Show them the face of friendship and offer them the hand of support. Encourage them with your works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. The peace of Christ be with us all. Let us pray together. Gracious Father, we thank you for leading Gil and Courtney Lowry and Reverend Paul and Betty Lang to desire to join us in fellowship and love and for giving them the joy to confess their faith to us. Guide us with your wisdom as we worship and work together. Mold our minds and hearts in a single Christ-like will so that we may be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, and faithful in prayer. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
Our worship now continues with our prayers that are printed for you on pages 9 and 10. Please stand. At the place for special prayers this morning, we'll again pray for Pastor Noah Bader and his family. If you recall, we prayed for him last week as their two-year-old son was undergoing tests. Uh, this last week, they discovered that the tests uh, came back positive. Their two-year-old son has cancer. Uh, it is running up and down his spine. He faces a long road ahead, but we have a big and gracious God. So let us go to him in prayer. We praise you, O Christ our King, for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. Hallelujah. The Lord God Almighty reigns. We praise you, O Christ our King, because you were slain, and with your blood you purchased us for God. From every tribe and language and people and nation, you have called us into your kingdom and have made us priests to serve our God and Father. Help us love and serve you as your dear children. We praise you, O Christ our King, because you have searched for us and found us. Lead us to the green pastures and quiet waters of your saving love, so that we may enjoy peace and comfort for our souls. Heal our hearts from sin and guilt, and strengthen us when we are weak. We praise you, O Christ our King, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. Come with your mighty power to break and defeat every evil plan and purpose of the devil, of the ungodly influences and ideas of the world, and of our own sinful nature. Strengthen our confidence in knowing that your kingdom will never be destroyed. We praise you, O Christ our King, because you have destroyed death and brought life and immortality to life through the gospel. Reign in our hearts, that we may serve you faithfully, and speak boldly to others of your saving love. Equip us to be your witness in the world. Heavenly Father, you promise that you care for all your children and always work according to their eternal good. We ask you especially to comfort the Bader family with that beautiful promise. Keep their son Phineas safe in your care as he goes through surgery and treatment for his cancer. Give Noah and his wife Melissa confidence in your continuing mercy and grace. Assure them that you are watching over all of them and that no matter what happens, they are safe and secure in the forgiveness and eternal life won by Christ, our righteous King. And hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. Look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever, King of kings and Lord of lords. The Lord God Almighty reigns. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. We continue now with the preparation for Lord's Supper. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God. We praise you especially for the promise to preserve your church to the end of time when Christ will come again as king to judge all people and take his own to glory. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise and bless your holy name.
Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. tells us that when we receive Lord's Supper, we are receiving bread and wine, as well as the body and blood of our Savior Jesus, for the forgiveness of our sins. In his word, God also tells us that when we, in fact, commune together, we are confessing agreement in faith and teaching with those with whom we commune. For this reason, we kindly ask that if you're a guest or a visitor with us, you not commune at this time, because that will give us the opportunity to study God's word together and to see what he says about this wonderful sacrament. And it will also keep you from being in the uncomfortable position of saying you agree with what our church teaches without first knowing what our church teaches. We will practice table distribution again this morning, so what that means is that Tom, our usher, will, will invite about seven or eight people to come up forward at one time. Uh, we'll start on this side of the sanctuary. After you receive Lord's Supper, you may return to your seats by the side aisles, and then we'll, re we'll go to this side of the sanctuary. Come, for all things are now ready. body of your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, given into death for you. Take and eat. This is the true body and drink. of your Lord and Savior this is Jesus the true Christ, blood of given our into Lord death and Savior Jesus for Christ, shed for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Take and drink. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, bless you in your shed for you all the days of for the your forgiveness of and all of your sins. You your His blood of Christ shed for you. Now this true body and blood of your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will strengthen and preserve you and keep you in the one true faith until life everlasting. Go in peace. Your sins are forgiven. This is the true body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, 
forgiven for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Take and eat. This is the true body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Lord and Savior Jesus Christ shed for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Take and drink. This is the true blood of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now this true body the blood of your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will strengthen and preserve you and keep you in the one true faith until life everlasting. Go in peace. Your sins are forgiven. We continue now with the prayer that's printed for you on page 12. Please stand. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. And his mercy endures forever. We give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us with this holy supper and through your word. We pray that through these you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another. Serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Our closing hymn is hymn 341, Crown Him with Many Crowns. 